All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for taking time out of your day to watch the video. I really appreciate it. We have more PlayStation news, rumors, and leaks to go over and cover today. So before we get into these topics, do me a favor. Be sure to hit the like button if you do end up enjoying the video or finding it informative. And if you are new here to the channel, please consider hitting that subscribe button as well. The first set of topics talks about Naughty Dog as well as The Last of Us Part 1 or Remake, whatever you want to call it. This is reading from PlayStation Lifestyle where they say Naughty Dog unveiled The Last of Us 1 Remake test character model upgrade which looks incredibly lifelike. In fact, the very brief clip that Naughty Dog shared on Twitter might as well be a snippet from a live action film. Unlike the original release from 2013, the PS5 and PC remake is very closely based on her model and actress Annie Wershing. And over on Twitter, Neil Druckmann says Annie Wershing destroyed us with her performance as Tess. Love that we get to better show off her acting chops with Part 1. The article continues by saying Naughty Dog has said that The Last of Us Part 1 PS5 and PC release is a complete remake of the original. It comes with modernized gameplay, improved controls, and a number of accessibility options. The remake will also utilize 3D audio, haptics, and adaptive triggers, among other PS5 hardware features. Continuing to talk about The Last of Us Part 1, I have an interesting article here from PlayStation Universe where it says Digital Foundry has scrutinized footage of The Last of Us Part 1 in an attempt to find out if Naughty Dog is building the game using The Last of Us Part 2 game engine and results make for a compelling read. While the report wasn't able to state unequivocally if The Last of Us Part 1 was running on the sequel's engine, there's plenty of evidence to suggest this is the case. One of the biggest comparisons between the games is done using a shot of the hospital flashback sequence in The Last of Us Part 2 and the same location seen in the trailer for The Last of Us Part 1. Digital Foundry notes that it's conceivable we're looking at The Last of Us remake that uses The Last of Us 2 engine or perhaps an enhanced version of it. Elsewhere, the report also claims that The Last of Us Part 1 may be targeting 1440p, which was the case with The Last of Us Part 2 after it was patched on PS5 to support 60fps 1440p. Sadly, there's no way for Digital Foundry to dive into any gameplay enhancements since we simply haven't seen anything of that just yet. And that's the thing with The Last of Us Part 1 or The Last of Us Remake. The more comparison shots we see, the more impressed I find myself, I mean, seeing this shot of Tess, I know that there are some people saying, oh, she looks older, or, you know, they changed her model too much, but what I see is a much more realistic depiction of somebody who has been surviving in a post-apocalyptic world for, you know, many years. It seems like they really are just ramping up the attention to detail to an extreme degree, which is to be expected with a studio like Naughty Dog, but they're also going for realism. And Digital Foundry doing this comparison and talking about using The Last of Us Part Two engine, it's kind of weird because I've seen some people reacting negatively about this, basically saying, or at the very least insinuating that this would be some type of downgrade or a bad thing and i'm i'm perplexed by this because the one thing about the last of us part two that i did think was incredible is how much they improved pretty much every aspect of the gameplay with the new engine that they were using for the last of us part two and if i'm not mistaken the appeal of something like the last of us part one for most people who were interested in it is the fact that we are going to see that engine utilized for The Last of Us Part 1, and it will very likely be an upgraded version of that engine. So I'm finding myself impressed with what Naughty Dog is doing with The Last of Us Part 1 from a visual aspect. I like the realism that they're going for, the attention to detail, the changes to the character models. I am liking everything I'm seeing. At this point in time, I'm feeling more eager to see the gameplay because a lot of people are saying that maybe this is going to be the difference maker for a lot of people and i may be one of those people where they're saying there are going to be some pretty drastic changes to the gameplay in hopefully a good way and that's really kind of what i want to see at this point but still talking about naughty dog we know that they are working on a new project but it seems like whatever this new project is that they're working on They've been working on it for at least two years now. So reading from 
PlayStation Lifestyle, it says Naughty Dog has been working on its latest project for at least the past two years, according to the resume for Josh Schur, who is working as a writer slash narrative designer on the unannounced project since May 2020. In addition, Kurt Marginu has updated his Twitter profile to confirm he's the game director of a mystery title, which is surely the game that Neil Druckmann is involved with. Druckmann confirmed during Summer Game Fest that he's working on a brand new title at Naughty Dog, but made it clear that he wasn't in any position to talk about it right now, not unless PlayStation leaks it, that is. So this was something that, you know, I think a lot of people were happy to hear because we've been talking a lot about The Last of Us, and we know that The Last of Us, as of right now, between part one and the multiplayer game is kind of taking center stage. I think a lot of PlayStation fans were really hoping that Naughty Dog was also working on something new. Now they don't confirm whether or not this is a new IP, so there's a 50-50 chance it could be an already established IP or it could be something brand new. We will have to wait to find out, but whatever it is they're working on, they've been working on it for at least two years. Moving on to the next topic though, we're talking about PlayStation's Fire Sprite Studio and how we are getting confirmation that they have moved into a much, much bigger office space, uh, kind of letting us know that, yeah, this team is continuing to grow and they're going to need more office space. They're going to need a bigger studio to accommodate all of these developers and all of this talent that they're bringing on board. Once again, for PlayStation Universe, it says Fire Sprite Studios has announced that the Sony-owned company is packing up and moving to a new office that's roughly 20 times larger than its current base of operations. The team will be moving to a four-building cluster at Duke Street in Liverpool, which is roughly 50,000 square feet of space. This is significantly larger than its current base of operations, which is located at Liverpool's Vanilla Factory and measures at about 2,300 square feet. So it says here the new offices are only a three minute walk from Fire Sprite's current location and the company has taken out a 10 year lease for the property. So I wanted to let you guys know about this because as we know, PlayStation Studios continues to grow and it continues to expand. And even though acquisition talk is the thing that really makes the headlines, it's worth noting that this is another way in which PlayStation continues to grow their studios. They're giving a studio like Fire Sprite uh, a lot of money here to spend on new office space because that is a massive upgrade and it seems like Sony is really expecting a lot from Fire Sprite considering how massive they are and in order to make that happen you know they're going to need to have the right studio space and they're going to have to be comfortable to be able to do their best work so just wanted to let you guys know about that Moving to the next topic, though, we're talking about an interesting feature that was discovered regarding PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium. Reading from PlayStation Lifestyle, it says the PS5 wishlist system apparently works with the revamped PS Plus by notifying players when games in their wishlists are added to the service. As reported by Push Square, if a game in your wishlist is added to the Extra and Premium tiers, which will be refreshed, you'll be pinged by your PS5 this nifty little change is welcome considering the sheer size of the PS Plus Extra and Premium Catalog. And I just wanted to make everybody aware of this because I think a lot of people might find this incredibly useful. Obviously, people are going to be paying attention to the monthly refreshes that PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium get. And so if there are certain games that you're hoping make it to either service Add them to your wish list and you'll be notified by your PS5 or by the PlayStation app that, hey, it's now part of that. So you might want to consider subscribing to it if you haven't already. Just wanted to let you guys know. We're moving on to the next topic, though. And this is just, again, reminding everybody that if you're interested, Resident Evil 2 and 3 Remake, as well as Resident Evil 7 Next Gen upgrades are now available for PS5. The Resident Evil 2, 3, and 7 PS5 next-gen upgrades got a surprise launch directly following the Capcom Digital Showcase. These patches upgrade each game to take advantage of the PS5 hardware and are said to also improve the visuals and performance. The new updates for Resident Evil 2, 3, and 7 focus on adding ray tracing, support for higher frame rates, and 3D audio. The PS5 version also brings DualSense support for haptic feedback and adaptive triggers. So again, these upgrades are out now and if you already own these games you can get these upgrades for free so there you go 
Next up, we're talking about Persona 5 Royal PS5 Remaster, seemingly confirmed, releasing October 21st. So reading from Push Square, they say this has been needlessly confusing, hasn't it? After Xbox seemingly embargoed news on PlayStation remasters of Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden, we received a press release that said both games and Persona 5 Royal were coming to PS5. We reported on that, but the information has quickly become outdated as Atlas has supposedly confirmed which platforms these games are actually aiming for. Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden are heading to PS4, not PS5. But Persona 5 Royal seems to be a different story. We say seems because at this point, Atlas is clearly capable of providing incorrect information. In any case, Persona 5 Royal is listed for PS5 and it's also there on the PlayStation blog. They are corroborating this. So this is apparently a PS5 remaster of Persona 5 Royal, one of the PS4's absolute best RPGs. It will release on October 21st, and it will, according to Atlas's website, include all previously released DLC. So yeah, this whole thing has been kind of confusing with the Xbox Bethesda showcase because they have embargoed stuff for at least two days, which is so strange. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but you know, this as of right now is where it stands. If you are a Persona fan and, you know, you have a PS5, you know, you can look forward to the Persona 5 Royal Remaster. But where we're going to end the video is talking about the strange situation with all of these games being embargoed for two days. Any multi-platform game that was at the Xbox Showcase. Again, reading from Push Square, they say some of the games announced during Microsoft's big Xbox showcase on Sunday are coming to PS5 and PS4, but it would appear you weren't supposed to know for at least 48 hours. It appears that Microsoft enforced embargoes on some of its partners, including Atlas and Koei Tecmo. We received press releases from both publishers embargoed until 6 p.m. BST today, preventing us from mentioning the PlayStation ports. Now, this information was ultimately published premature by other websites, enabling us to bring you the news earlier than intended, but it's still noteworthy. Platform holders rarely ever mention competing consoles during press conferences, of course, but usually publishers will clarify which platforms their games are coming to in press releases and social media posts sent out immediately afterwards. This was true for Street Fighter VI and Resident Evil 4, for example, which were both announced at Sony's most recent State of Play, However, in this instance, it appears that Microsoft didn't want news of the PS5 versions of Persona and PS5 and PS4 versions of Wolong Fallen Dynasty to be publicized until at least two days after its Xbox showcase. As far as we understand, this was enforced specifically on Japanese titles as games like Minecraft Legends were announced for rival platforms like the PS5 and PS4 and Nintendo Switch immediately after the live stream. I've seen a lot of people talking about this and it's kind of understandable why people are either a little bit annoyed or confused because this just doesn't make much sense. I don't know what Microsoft thinks they're really going to achieve by embargoing this information specifically with these games for two days. I don't think it's going to do anything. I don't think it's going to matter. A lot of PlayStation fans obviously will discover before these games launch that, yeah, they're also for PlayStation and that's where they're going to buy them. These games in particular, I can kind of understand why Microsoft would try to do something like this because these are games that sell really, really well on PlayStation and they're games that are kind of known to be on PlayStation, right? Like these uh, development teams and you know, their history, it's very much associated with PlayStation, but still, it's just a little strange to see Microsoft do something like this. Uh, what we know is that Sony hasn't done anything like this. As this article pointed out, with a lot of these games during the state of play, yeah, Sony's not going to explicitly say, just like Microsoft isn't, that, hey, yeah, they're coming to the rival platform too. No, but they're not stopping, you know, the publishers from immediately making it clear that these games are also coming to Xbox. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit of a strange situation there, but figured I'd let you guys know about it. That's going to do it for this video, though. I hope you did enjoy it. I hope you did find it informative. If you did, leave it a like, subscribe if you're new, hit the bell notification icon, and feel free to share the video out on top of all that. But until next time, guys, take care.